If you're a citizen of humanity, which you are, you know, if you're part of the human race, it is in you to blame other people and to blame circumstances and to blame somebody else. It is in you to just ignore your part and to get so enamored with your story, your poor, your, you know, your pitiful story, the story that people cry and they write you checks and they offer you jobs and they say, no wonder, you know, that, that's, we get so enamored with our story that we don't stop long enough to ask the question, what was my part in the breakdown? What was my part in the thing I'm having to restart. And the reason we're so good at this is because we're related to two biblical characters named Adam and Eve. Now, in just a minute, I, I wanna tell you just a little bit of their story, but before I do, I wanna say something about Adam and Eve. Um, if you grew up in church, the whole Adam and Eve thing's like, oh yeah, Adam and Eve, I, I got that. You know, I kinda believe that, I don't really think about it, I just grew up believing that. If you, um, if you didn't grow up in church or you had the same freshman English class that I had, where we looked at Genesis as a myth, and the uh, creation story as one of many ancient myths and lots of different cultures and civilizations had creation myths. And you walked out of that class going, huh, so my Sunday school teacher was wrong, my, teach my preacher was wrong, my parents were wrong, my small group leaders were wrong, my freshman English teacher, you know, they're brilliant. So they've, they've kind of taken away from me the whole out of anything. If that's where you are, I totally get that. I totally respect you for that. I do not expect you to believe Adam and Eve were real people, okay? But you need to know one thing. The reason Christians take Adam and, the Adam and Eve story seriously is not because it's in the Bible. The reason we take the Adam and Eve story seriously is because Jesus took the Adam and Eve story seriously. And Christians follow Jesus, so we just go with whatever he said. Now you've heard me say this a hundred times, but you'll hear me say it a hundred times more. The reason we take Jesus seriously is because if someone can predict their own death and resurrection and pull it off, we just go with whatever he says. <laughs> that's why we believe, that's why we take Adam and Eve seriously, not because it's in Genesis. Now, here's the amazing thing. If you just see this as literature, which I'm, I'm all for that, you can see it as literature. The insights in this ancient, and it's not just ancient, it's ancient, ancient, ancient literature. It is, old, it is so old, it is older than old. There's so much dust on it, it is so ancient. There is so much insight about human nature in this you know, triply ancient piece of literature that when we read it in just a second, whoever wrote it had so much insight, I think you should read everything else he wrote, whether you think it's inspired or not. That's how brilliant this story is that some of us think actually happened, others, others of us think it was an ancient way of describing the way that the world began. Either way you go, it's incredible. So you don't have to believe it's historical, but look at what we learn about ourselves from this little piece of Genesis. Here's where I'm gonna kind of skip through the story to get to the part I wanna talk most about, but we'll give it a little context. So God, this is Genesis chapter one. So God created mankind in his own image. Boy, there's a lot packed into that. In the image of God, he repeats it, Moses repeats it. He created them, male and female, he created them. And he, he goes on, he says this, and God blessed, but God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Adam said, okay, what about the 10 commandments? And God said, okay, that didn't come for like hundreds of years later, just run around and have babies and enjoy yourself in the garden. Adam didn't really say that, but this was like, there was, this is amazing, this is amazing. In the Garden of Eden, according to the writer of Genesis, there was just one rule. Now, nobody, I don't know who would have made this up. There was just one rule. God said, you see that tree over there? Don't eat from the fruit of that tree. That's the only rule. So there's not like 10 commandments, no, there's just one. 
and it seems kind of irrelevant, doesn't it? Like you can eat anything you want, do anything, run around the garden naked, just don't, I gotta have one rule because by having one rule it establishes me as the boss, okay? So just don't do that. It's not even a hard rule. Just don't eat of that tree, right? And so of course they did exactly what we did when we were kids, you know, we'd gravitate toward the one thing or the two things or the three things we're not supposed to do. But here's what's amazing. In the beginning, according to Christian belief, in the beginning, according to Jewish belief, in the beginning when God had everything just like God wanted it, there was only one rule. Now that's brilliant. If that's not true, whoever made this up, I mean, in other words, in the beginning, when God had everything just the way he wanted it, there was no need for a bunch of rules because people were created under his authority. And they said, well, of course, we'll do whatever you say. You're like, God, you know, what, what else would we do? Well, if that's the way it is, there's no need for a bunch of rules. But then Adam and Eve broke the one rule. And here's what scripture teaches. Here's what you know, Christians believe. And when they broke this rule, you got messed up and I got messed up. Sin entered the world. Now, you may not believe in sin, but, I, but there is sin and you're a sinner. And if that's offensive, let me tell you what I mean by that. I don't mean you're a sinner because something in the Bible. I'm, I mean you're a sinner in this way. You don't even keep your own rules. You don't even exercise three times a week. You eat stuff that's bad for you. You say unkind things to people and you feel guilty about it later and then you repeat yourself. You, you, can't even, you can't even break your own bad habits. You don't need the Bible to tell you there's something wrong with you. Come on, you know there's something wrong with you. I know there's something wrong with me. The Bible calls it sin, you can call it anything you want. But we know this, at some point in the, in the world, in the history of humanity, something bad got blended into the way we think and the way we act. Christians think this is how it happened. You, you may have your own theory. The great thing about Christians is we have someone to blame it on. <laughs> you don't, it's your own fault, okay? Now, so sin enters the world, Adam and Eve commit the first sin according to Christian theology, and then this is where we find out why we are so messed up. So here's what happens next. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and here's what they did, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden, I could put in there, that God created. So now they're hiding from God in God's garden. This isn't smart, but you know what? When you screw up, you do unsmart things. And here's what you do. When you, this is why this is so brilliant, whoever wrote this. I think it's inspired, doesn't matter. This ancient, ancient, ancient person pinpointed the fact that when we do something wrong, we hide. We hide. We hide from ourselves, we hide from the people around us because of guilt and because of shame. We hide. And, and, and we hide in the most obvious places. And then when we get caught, we say what? I'm, yeah, it's not a trick question. We say, I'm sorry. And no one believes us and they shouldn't because you've been, you've been doing this for eight years. And the only reason you said you're sorry is because you got what? And you know what you've been doing the whole time before you got caught? You were hiding. You were hiding you or you were hiding something. This is what we do when we mess up. We hide until we're caught. And then here's what happened next. But the Lord God called to the man. I love this. In fact, maybe the reason you're watching today or listening today is for this just one part. The rest of my message may be irrelevant to you. When Adam and Eve screwed up, God went looking for them. Now they've really, they've just messed up in a big way. They've like messed all of us up. Like this was like the worst sin ever, okay, ever. And this is like the worst sin ever. And God went looking for Adam and Eve. God is looking for you. And he's not looking to, you know, put you over his knee. He's looking for you because he loves you. And when you read the rest of this story, that becomes obvious. Anyway, okay, but the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He knew. He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid. Why are you afraid? Because I was naked, which meant I knew I'd done something wrong. I felt shame. So I hid. And he said, God said, who, because God knew there was a who involved. Who told you that you were naked? In other words, who told you you were guilty? Who told you to feel shame? How did you figure this out? Who told you? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And Adam said, yes, I did. And I take full responsibility for my actions. <laughs> Do with me as you will, but leave Eve out of it. She's innocent. <laughs> That's what he should have said. Now this is so interesting before I tell you what really happened. If you're not laughing, you're going, why is everybody laughing? Because 
We all were raised in Sunday school. It's okay. Here's, here, here's the thing, okay? Here's the thing. This is so huge. This is why this literature, oh my gosh. The very first thing the first two people in the world did after they sinned was blame somebody else. The very first thing they did after they got caught was what you tend to do and I tend to do when I get caught. They blamed. Here's what really happened. The man said, the woman that you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. In other words, okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. God, this is your fault and this is her fault. So you guys get together, you work it out, then you apologize to me. And maybe if I've cooled off a little bit by the time you guys, you know, come to me after you get it all worked out, I'll be gracious enough to forgive God and Eve because this is not my fault. Now, here's the interesting thing about this statement. It was true. It just wasn't the whole truth. Now, listen to me. This is what we do. In our past where things fell apart, whether it was financially, relationally, romantically, you know, academically, you know, whatever it was, whatever it was, we all want to tell a story that's mostly true. We just don't tell the whole truth. And after you tell your story that's 90% of the truth long enough, you start to believe it's the whole story and you hide. But if you don't own your part of your own history, you will lay the groundwork for undermining your own future. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. It's not my fault. This is true. It's just not the whole truth. So here's what I want you to hear me talk. This is so important. I really can't even exaggerate how important this is, okay? If you don't pause and take responsibility for your part in your history, the part of your history that's caused you to have to start over, you will drag it with you into your future, no matter how small it is, no matter how insignificant it is. And ultimately, you will undermine your own happiness. Here's the deal. You cannot blame your way into a better future. You can blame your way into the future. You cannot blame your way into a better future. More to the point, blame enables us to smuggle our issues into our future. Blame enables us to smuggle. You know what I mean by smuggle? It's like, hey, if nobody knows about it and I don't have to confess it and everybody feels sorry for me when I kind of give them the macro story, then I can keep my part tucked in my pocket and I can carry my part into the future. Blame allows you to smuggle your dysfunction, your habit, your poor relationship skills, your poor decision-making skills, your, un, you know, your unresolved daddy issues and mommy issues. Blame allows you to smuggle your stuff into your own future. That's why it's deadly. That's why you just can't do it. That's why before you start over, or as you begin thinking about starting over, you've got to stop and ask some really difficult questions. What was my part? What was my part? What was my part? And you got to own it. And the last little statement I'll give you is this. Blame sets us up for repeat performance, doesn't it? Because your blame allows you to smuggle your past into your future which sets you up to do exactly what you did last time, even though what you did last time may seem very inconsequential to you. There you are again, there you go again. Now here's the thing, here's the thing. I'm gonna give you a little exercise to do, okay? Here's the thing, look. Owning your part of your past, owning your part of your past, and let's, let me be real clear. Owning your part of the past, owning your part of the past, here's what happens. It drops the temperature, it drops the temperature of your emotions. And as the temperature drops, you gain clarity. 
And you can't make great decisions about your future without clarity. As long as you're blaming, as long as you're hiding, as long as you're smuggling, there is an energy, there's a tension, there's an unresolved thing. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it is gonna impair your ability to see clearly into your own future as you make the next round of decisions. It just is, it, it thwarts and it distorts your ability to make decisions. Now, Jesus said something so profound. It's one little statement that if you've read the Sermon on the Mount, you read right by it, but this, this is so profound. I think there's so much packed in this little phrase. Here's what he said. He said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. In other words, there is a relationship between purity and clarity. There's a relationship between purity and clarity. And the purer your heart is, the cleaner your heart is, the more work you've done to clean out the junk, to get rid of the cobwebs, to get rid of the stuff you're hiding, to get rid of the stuff you've never owned up to, to get rid of the stuff that you're afraid to admit. Because if I admit this, and I understand this more than you think, if I admit my part, I can't stay as mad as I've enjoyed being mad. If I, if I embrace my, if I own my part, that means I've just taken away a little bit of what I blamed him for and her for and, and them for. And if I begin to own my part, then I can't stay as angry about their part. That's what I mean. The temperature begins to drop and you begin to see clearly and you'll make better decisions. Blessed are the pure in heart for they see God. And as long as there's something that you're hiding, as long as there's impurity in your thinking or your, you know, your past or again, your transparency, you lack the clarity you need to ensure that next time is better than last time. So this is a really, really big deal. So I want you to think about this today. Here's what I'd love for you to do. I want you to go home and I want you to get a sheet of paper and a pen or pencil or whatever. And I just want you to draw a circle. And this circle represents, this is, the, this is the sphere of blame. This is the circle of blame. You, this, is, this is everything that contributed to the fact that you've got to start over. And I want you to take whatever you're writing with and I want you to draw a slice that represents your part. Now, in other words, you may say, hey, you know, it was 50-50. It was half me, her, my fault and half her part. Nobody does this, okay? There's no story there. Okay, this, this isn't a good story. It was half of it was my fault and her part. Okay, that's not, this isn't what we do. Maybe 25%, you know, 75% of it was his fault, my company, my boss, my teacher, and then 25% of it, okay, I'll own 25% of it. Nobody does that either, honestly, unless you just, you know, are an incredible person. Here's what it usually looks like. It's kind of like this. <laughs> she was an idiot. Now I, I, I might've had something to do with the problems, you know. <laughs> My entire industry is screwed up. Now, I, you know, I didn't follow, okay, I might have had my deal, okay. Here's the thing, okay, this is huge. To make peace with your past, to move on without your past dragging you down, to make peace with your past, you make peace with your past by owning your peace of your past. Now, it's cute, but it's bigger than cute, it's huge, it's life-changing. You make peace with your past. That is, you resolve your past before you move into the future by owning, recognizing, embracing, admitting, bringing it front and center, your peace of your past.